Here we are, uh, episode 16 of the Native Overstayer podcast. And today we're joined by the uh, big, the powerful, the inspirational, uh, the young Ronnie Clark. Sir, thank you so much for coming on today, brother. It's so good to see you. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to come on with you, Pad and Jack. Um, I've been looking forward to this for a while, actually. Uh, I'm so glad now. It's quite amazing what, the, what COVID, what uh, we might think that it's something... Uh, uh, negative but look what look at the positives <laughs> we've been able to do this <laughs> it's so true i mean we had the uh we had the young lion on as i put it uh on our podcast with your boy but uh now we've got mufasa himself it's uh it's real, <laughs> real humbling and an honor thank you sir thank you bro i'm just turning around when you said uh the mufasa i'm looking for my dad uh, the, <laughs> <laughs> well, <listen. Hello. laughs> how's the family or ronnie how's, how's everyone been coping uh, during the sort of lockdown period yeah, I think like um, like every other family, we, uh, you know, you're, you're what three, four weeks into it, and you know you're um, starting to, you know, just to see the few little bits and pieces of challenges here and there. But I think for us as Pacifica, it's this is who we are. We're a collective um, type of society and it's a type of community. So this is really, in essence, this is you know, this is wonderful. I, I'm I'm loving having all my my children home. Um, this is probably the first time I've had them together for six months. It was announced um, a couple of days back of your new role with the uh, NZRU. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yep. So the, my, my new role at New Zealand Rugby um, is the bus speaker engagement manager role. Um, it's, I suppose, that one of the things that comes springs to my mind straight away and to many of our community would be, would be given the contribution to, um, of bus speaker to New Zealand Rugby for a long time and globally, it's one would think, wow, wow, I'm so glad that New Zealand Rugby have opened their hearts to our Pacific in this way. Um, and so, well, um, and it's been great because we've been really needing to have um, um, a voice, um, a role, a position within NZR that helps. I think one of the key areas is around um, the real lifting the cultural responsiveness of New Zealand rugby community wide um, in Aotearoa, how they can connect with our, our Pacific people, how they can bring the best out of us in terms of players, because many of us have those stories as bus speaker where we've had coaches, where we've had, where we've had players, um, players are together in, in, within the environment where there's been a lot of inappropriateness, um, cultural clashes, um, that sense of, oh, I don't belong because the way that we're doing life here and the way that the, the, the culture within this team, I don't connect. And did I, why is the coach always shouting and swearing and have I done something wrong? So we have those sort of narratives that, we, that we've kind of, many of us have had to, have to overcome. And I think part of this role will really um, help with that. Um, there's the, uh, and when we talk about the way our Pasifika way, I think the, the, one of the things that you think about is in terms of well-being, um, our well-being and the way that we look after. There's many aspects to our well-being. It's not just the the, the mental well-being. There's our um, there's our family, our, our whānau as well. Whereas the Western um, culture might not really focus on that um, when we're making and really important decisions for our careers within rugby. Ronnie, you were involved with the. Um the Navigating Two Worlds project, which I guess had a big influence now on this role that you have in New Zealand Rugby. What were some of the other findings that you had from that sort of research and what were some of the other outcomes from that? Yep, I think the, so the, those, probably those first two key ones are really important around in terms of understanding who we are as a people. And the research was, was really, a couple of other key areas was to find out how our, a lot of our bus speaker can uh, we contribute in such a massive way in terms of um, player um, 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 around, around in terms of players, but some of the non-playing roles. That was probably one of the key things that we we realised that from the research that we really weren't and we didn't have influence in. Even like, so, when I, we talk about non-playing roles, plays roles like um, administrative roles um, with the provincial unions within the supers. Um, the Super Rugby franchises, and at all levels of rugby, but also too we think about even governance, and we always talked about um, with many of us that were coming that, that had been through the, that whole life of rugby, 
But if we're not at the tables where they make decisions for everyone else, then we can't influence. And so in essence that we also had that sense of responsibility that we needed to really um, to, 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 to move into those spaces. Um, but we are asking our Pacific communities to consider um, a, a diff whole different of, of area of influence within rugby around the administrative, around the governance, um, those are um, where, we, where we would love to have more of our I thought what was interesting out of that research was um, one of the findings was that a lot of our Pacifica community were afraid to fail uh, in terms of coming going into that space. And do you think that's, that's, that's a Pacific thing or is that more that sort of tall poppy syndrome? What are your thoughts there? Yeah, I, I think that's, that, that could be, that is a, 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 a part of it. A small, I, I, um, well, if that's what the research is, certainly um, has really found, and I think that's really being very honest, which is wonderful for our community to do so. But I think it's it's because, again, we don't we don't it's not a traditional role that we move into, sure. and um, very I mean very similarly, very earlier in the earlier days, there wasn't that many of us um, even playing. I mean, I grew up watching Brian Williams. You know, he was he was our hero. He was our Pacific hero. But, and so that obviously really started to influence many of us coming through that we wanted to, could we aspire, could we dare to dream to play for the All Blacks one day? And so I think what we, what we need now is that as we, as we inspire more of our, our bus fika to come on board in those different areas um, of administrative as governance, but I think what we, it's really important that we bring the training um, as well that helps them that takes away those, those uh, that 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 sense of um, whether it's failure or that sense of oh no uh, that's that's for them that's what they do but no that they once they learn once they get given given the training then that's where I think they can really make much more be of an informed decision about hey I can do that um, mm -hmm. and I can because we've got the time and I want to because the their children are involved and I think our, I think that's an, another big thing that that it is our kids that are involved but. Um, which is a great thing. Um, Jack was also mentioning before we start the podcast about your um, your journey with mental health and, and working with Navar. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about that, uh, Ronnie. Yeah. I mean, mental health is quite a serious sort of uh, subject. It's becoming a bit more talked about now, but you know, back in the day, it was sort of swept under the under the rug. It's it's good to see people like yourself and and with organisations like Navar, um, you know helping people out, you know, reaching out and, and saying it's okay to feel down and, and you guys are giving them the, the tools and the, um, the ways of getting out of that sort of stuff. So, are you still with Levar or? Yes, I, I, um, the last couple of years um, before moving into this role, I was, in fact, probably the last um, 10 years I've been involved in Pacific Health and it was interesting moving out of rugby um, I worked with another organization that really helped to bring behavioral change through um, through the the, the 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 platform of sport um, mm. and uh, it was called quantum sport or inner fit I did that for about three or four years but then I had a real draw um, in my heart to coming back to serving our communities and so um, I moved into working in Pacific health under the Waitematsa DHB, um, Pacific um, arm of the DHB was Takanga Fuhi, and I worked in the addictions um, sector under Tupu Services. And so I was really working at the coal face. Um, the great thing about it was able to engage in my pastoral uh, um, care and support uh, um, that, 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 that uh, DNA of mine that I love around counseling and around journeying people through change. And, um, and it was, so I was working at the coal face, and then a couple of years um, from there, um, after working at Tupu and Tikanga Fohe, I moved into working in with Leva. And Leva are a Pacific Health Workforce Development Group. So that means that um, they they are they are they have an important role to supporting all our Pacific service health service providers in our communities, um, help building capacity, um, getting more numbers, um, getting a um, of, of our young people from through, through tertiary. Um, that or, or, or in the community that have experience working within the Pacific Health sector um, also helps to, in terms of capability. So they provide scholarships um, if you want to further study um, and um, and a lot of them leadership training. 
which is important to help them lift again, trying to get them to aspire higher um, into the into their roles rather than um, okay, it's great to be a supervisor, but let's go for team leader. From team leader, let's go to service manager. Service manager, let's keep pushing up. Let's keep pushing up. And then resourcing is another important part that we do. We um, resourcing and ensuring that they're getting a lot of um, research-based um, um, information uh, resources into our for our service providers. So it really builds. And so Levi were really important around that key area. So um, suicide prevention was in, was one of the key areas that Levi worked in. Um, um, uh, mental health, um, addictions, disability, public health. Uh, was just some key areas where Levar was was mandated by the government to really work in those spaces. And I, I, I enjoyed it. I really did. And one of the um, um, the challenges that we faced was around lifting the cultural um, understanding, awareness, responsiveness of the wider um, health system. I, I, I really enjoy it. I still connect them with Levar. I can see a lot of the work that Levar does um, mm. that really branches into the work, particularly as you say, Pat, with sports. Um, JK has really opened up, John, Sir John Kirwan has really opened up the space around the, the just men talking, talking and, and you know, mm. that we can talk about some of these issues, um, particularly around depression. So, um, and so there's that space of sport, there's concussion, there's other things that really, that, again, that live are moving to that can really support some of the work at New Zealand Rugby. I guess now with, with your role that you have working specifically with Pasifika, looking at, I guess, over the last couple of years where we've lost, and this is more, I guess, the professional players side, mm. where we've lost Pasifika professional rugby players for various reasons. I mean, someone like yourself with the background that you have, that you can go in and basically, you know, talk to these. So is that basically what your role is as well? You've got the community, but then you've also got the players that you work with? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the that's the thing about this particular role is that um, anything that um, that Pasifika touches, anything then anywhere where there is, that will him, impact our Pasifika players, men, young men and women, I um, get a sense that you're kind of asking that question around, especially a lot of our players that leave um, and are heading overseas. And it's been a bit of a frustrating um, thing for me even to read, um, even for media, to the way that, that they've been um, um, portraying our, our Pasifika boys who have served New Zealand rugby well, have served the All Black jersey well. Um, but again, then it's then they leave, and it's really trying to help them, the rugby community, the wider community to understand. Our priorities are very different. Our values, um, though values are the same, but the way that we live values are very different. Mm. And so that's part of what my role is, and that I really, um, I can really seem to to really help to shift, as I say, shifting perspectives, shifting um understanding so that again they understand why we do what we do and why we are um, how we are and understanding there's generational shifts as well so those are kind of the challenges that really um that this role i suppose has but again i i, I the thing that i'm i i really part of the that i rest assured is that is really knowing our communities are behind us um this uh, this this role and mm. so there's a on one hand there's the you to do a good job. <laughs> and the other hand, it's like, yes, I've got my community, our communities behind us. So yeah. that's the real positive. Could you see yourself ever sort of going to the highest level of, I guess, world rugby, being on the council and making an influence there? I mean, if we're talking governance mm. and making a change and an impact for Pacifica players or Pacific players around the Pacific, do you see yourself heading towards that direction? Is that a pathway you'd consider? Yeah, I, well, the, the really, the, the beauty of this role and the reason why this also one of the other reasons why this role has come about is already we're seeing the influence of Sir Michael um, uh, the Suma Yalauli who is on the governance board of New Zealand Rugby um, and I mean that's it's it's been one of those uh, those dreams that we've had for a while and, and having the navigating two worlds has been one of the groups and one of the the, um, um, the, the parts that have really helped to champion that but there's a lot of other groups around New Zealand that have dreamed for the same thing. That because it's it's much harder to influence from the top than it is to influence from the bottom. So mm -hmm. having Sir Michael 
And I think what's also really important, I think, um, I really believe about this role is also um, having the support of tangata whenua and working together with tangata whenua as well. Um, it's that tuakana tina relationship, I think, that, that I really believe that we really need to build those strong relationships. And we've already begun to do that here in New Zealand rugby, um, which, has been, which has been great. Um, Matua Luke um, is, uh, is the, the, the co-matua for New Zealand rugby. Um, so to answer your question, yes, if that's where my path lies, I mean, um, in future, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's wonderful. Um, but I think one of the other things is really not in that, is grabbing the many hands of others and lifting them up there. I think that's part of what uh, the, this role um, also uh, can really, um, and part of what I, I love to do, I'm you know, really building the, 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 the capacity of our, um, of our people into those roles. Um, and not just New Zealand, we need them. It was interesting that the, the chairman of New Zealand Rugby and the, at the Navigating Two Worlds, um, one of the meetings, he stopped and he said, he, go, he said to us, this is a travesty. We only have, he said, right across um, the, the provincial unions, um, right across our super franchises, we only have four people, that four Pacific people that sit in any of those boards. He said one of them is a New Zealand rugby, which is Laoli, um, Sir Michael Jones. And then we have at the Blues um, franchise, we have Lafionga um, Yapeseta, Sam Lotu Inga. And then on Auckland rugby, we have um, Kevin Mealamu and myself um, as, as president of Auckland rugby. So he said there's only four. And you can imagine there's, I think there's over, there's 26 provincial unions. We have five um, super franchises, but we've only, and across all of those governance, they all have their own governance and the New Zealand rugby. We only have four representatives on any of those. So we need to have more in those. It's reassuring to know that um, us Pacific people have somebody out there that's uh, going into bat for us, you know, whether it's in the mental health area or, or in the sporting rugby arena. Yeah, Pat, I, I suppose uh, we, we all have our callings in life and um, some callings are the same, some of them are similar, some of them are very different. And, um, and for me, I mean, I, I, I get to feel that. Um, and just coming into this role, I feel very blessed. Um, I've, I've been really privileged to do a lot of work um, since finishing rugby, even before, um, even before when rugby took over a large part of my life, that has prepared me for this role. Um, and so networks that I've been able to, to build and maintain, new skills, working in different sectors. Um, I've worked from Pacific education um, and then moved uh, more into Pacific health um, post-rugby. Um, and in the last couple of years, been working contra in, um, contracting. Mm. If I could sort of throw one more rugby question at you, Ronnie, it's um, what are your thoughts on sort of um, Bill Beaumont, who was the president of World Rugby, yeah. uh, talking about, I don't know if it's just an election campaign sort of promise, but talking about revisiting, changing the eligibility rules. Because I guess we're now with your role with New Zealand rugby and... New Zealand rugby is about and uh, is about you know fostering our Pacific rugby players to wear the black jersey after their time where they don't get to wear that black jersey anymore. Sort of what are the options that they have? What are your thoughts there? Well, a couple of things spring to mind straight away. It is interesting. It's around that time of elections for chairs and different positions. So things become political, and it's almost not that too dissimilar to what happens in terms of politics um, in government. Um, but in this I mean, it's part of who what we've been wanting for a long time. I, I, I think even when well, we were playing, when that uh, when they started to bring these eligibility rules, um, and that started to really you know um, um, hinder that ability for us to play for our home nations when when, when we left New Zealand. Yeah. Um, but New Zealand rugby have been quite supportive. They've been publicly supportive of it in the last couple of years. I think even Steve Chu um, towards the end of his tenure as the CEO began to talk about, yes, we've been, we've been advocating, we've been pushing it at an at a, um, IRB level, um, and uh, we just don't feel like we've had the support from the home nations or whoever else. Okay. So, so Ronnie, just with, uh, I guess, your involvement a couple of years back with the, the, the Malo Fee exhibition, what was that like? So, I mean, a big part of culture is a big part for us here in the Pacific. Well, what happened there? What was that like for you? 
Yeah, I suppose that uh, that is part of our journey um, um, about sort of the who we are as um, one as as a Samoan and two as Pacifica as well, um, living in in New Zealand. Um, it's that uh, it is that um, kind of that rediscovery of um, our culture, um, what it means, and you know. Um, I think in my life over the years, you kind of always had that, um, it comes in stages where you know you're ready for something. And um, like, for example, um, especially later on in the years when where it was that time for a lot of my generation and our family to take on ti um, Matei titles, I used to kind of always go, oh, no, I'm not ready, um, especially, especially in the time when I was playing. But certainly when I I'd finished, I had that sense, yes, I wanted to to um, I felt I was ready to, to take on the responsibility and uh, Jack you alluded to it before in terms of you know um, about tautua um, you know well alanga upu that says it or ala ida pula or tautua that is the pathway to leadership is through service and we serve in that way and I, I the malo fear was another stage of my life that um, where I, I, I saw that it is a um, and that I, I was ready to take on. Um, certainly, the learning our Anganu'u was an was an important part of that too. Um, and then the but in terms of the Malafia, I think when I finished playing rugby, I knew that was something that I knew I wanted to do. I had spoken to a lot of other isi or kama songai miki that um, that uh, that had the Malafia, that had the tatau. And uh, when I talked to them about it, I, there was just that warming in my heart. There was just that sense of this is something of who we are as um, as, as Samoan, um, as Pacifica, that is our marks of our symbols of who we are. As an 18 year old kid, when I finished school, our church went to Samoa and I wanted, and it was the first time I'd gone back to Samoa since I was born in Samoa, but we came to New Zealand, um, we were very young, but it was my first time back to, New, to Samoa as an 18 year old. And um, and one of the things that I wanted that, I, that was very strong in me was I wanted to get something when I was there that really symbolised me and identified me as Samoan. And I, I I didn't know what it was. I was kind of thought, do I need to buy something? Before I left, I saw uh, one of my my work colleagues. They had a a kaulima, <laughs> and I I looked at it and I saw it and went, that's what I want. That's what I'm. Gonna. I didn't tell my parents. I didn't tell anybody. But when I, we arrived there, I told, I said it to my cousin and I asked him, I want to go somewhere to get this done. This was 87, I think it was. And so we went, he took me to the Lafayette and, uh, and behind the Lafayette uh, um, um, uh, club was, uh, was where the Suruhape was, had his shop. And I went in and that's where the Koinga, where, um, where he was and uh, that he, he guard my Kaurima. And I, it was from that moment for me was that I realized that when I wanted to get the big one done, <clears throat> that it had to be a suluape that would, where I would finish the whole, whole tatau. And so years later, uh, quite a number of years later, that, um, yeah, I really had that strong sense to, to, to get the full better. And, um, and so that was quite a journey because it took me 10 years from after I first wanted to get it when I finished playing rugby, it took me 10 years to convince Siala <laughs> if I could have it. So it was really important. You needed to be one there in terms of Siala, my wife. But, so, but it was important for, for me to know that I had the blessing of my wife, my parents, my family mm -hmm. um, before getting the tatau. So when I did, and um, when um, was it Tanawai had, and, um, and Tu'u, who had brought the Suruapes over then, Mm. and um and created this space that i could um and many others of our brothers and sisters to get the, the tatau and the malu um the, it was it was quite a journey but when it started and it was with uh, with um with the suruapes as well with and so again it just kind of rounded and it came it really kind of um brought that home again for me what i wanted as a as an 18 year old to get it done by the um, to, by, uh, by the Suruape family and um, it's the, one of the most painful things I've ever experienced in my life <laughs> so oh, well, you know tackled by you no what was that bro well, I can't imagine being any more painful than getting tackled by you but uh, oh, you know all the injuries all the hits everything else nothing compared to the pain like the words of uh, of 
of um, of Junior before he started, by Paul before he started, he just whispered something very quietly. He said, yeah, Savia, on site. <laughs> and then it started. And um, and so the journey started from there. So, um, but I, but every day, every session finished, it was that more again, just that completing more of, of, um, of who I am and as as a as a as a olealo Samoa, but also olealo al Pacifica as well. Who we are, a child of of Samoa, but a child of Pacifica too. So, yeah, I, I it's it's something that um, having gone through that journey, um, that it was one that was not taken lightly. Um, it was also one that I realised it comes with responsibility. Um, but yeah, it's um, something that I, I feel very proud of too. So yeah, thank you. Thanks sounds like um, it sounds like a, a story I have, or Ronnie of a, a Golima. I um, I was a young <laughs> fellow as well, and I happened to uh, stumble across a uh, magazine called The War Cry, which was a Salvation Army magazine. And on the front cover was this young uh, up and coming rugby player. You might know him. I think it was you. <laughs> and I could see his Golima on his on his hand, and I looked at it and I was like, man. I like that Golima. And then one night I had a few to drink and uh, ended up with this one. <laughs> That's your inspiration as well. <laughs> now, with, with your better, um, with it, was there any clash with the Christian belief in regards to getting the better done? No, not for me. I think that was, you know, you seek counsel, you seek uh, wise counsel around that too. And you get the blessing. It wasn't just the blessings also from my, my family, but it was also a blessing from the, from the church and, from your pastors, from your faith there as well. That's really important. Um, and I think that's something that's got to be settled in your heart between even between you and God. Um, I, I kind of also can, you, you kind of can liken it to almost the, you know, coming through rugby and all of a sudden there's a run, you know, you've got Michael Jones, Christian doesn't play on Sundays. And then there's, oh, it's a Ronnie Clark and Inger. And, you know, in those earlier days, Christians, but they play on rugby. Uh, they play on Sunday. Well, what's going on here? So, you know, and I think it's something that's very personal. And I think uh, when you if, you, if you want to talk scriptures, I mean, there are scriptures, again, that support in terms of, well, one, us playing on Sunday, um, and but also, two that we felt, and again, without getting making it um, a, um, a, a, a theological <laughs> um, conversation, I think what's really important, too, that it's got to settle in your heart, and there's a piece about it, too, that you've got to know, mm -hmm. that um, for, for in both those cases, both in rugby, but also, too, in getting them, Getting the 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 um, the tatau of Samoa, I think that's really important. That it's got to also be that blessing from your faith, the ao, from your pastor, um, but also too, there's got to be a peace in your heart about it too. And I think that's really that makes it even more personal. Yeah. So no, um, you know, I, I I do know that uh, that it does exist. Um, I do know, and I've had some other friends, some wider who have said to me, "Hey, what are you, what are you doing?" And it's, but it's something in my heart that I've wanted for a long time. And it's something, a conversation that I've had with others for a long time who I really respect as well, who have counseled me around that too. So, yeah. Well, Jack, um, you played with uh, the young fella back at Suburbs um, <laughs> back in the day. And, and what was it like jumping into a team with the likes of Aroni and, and, and Mark Carter and, and, and some of the Andrew Blowers back in those days, mate? Yes, AJ. Uh, oh, that was a few years ago, wasn't it? Already? <laughs> Check out the suburb rugby club. They're still going, which is which is good to see. Uh, like I said before, I mean, I've um, been very blessed to to have played alongside people like Aroni and and to to watch them and see what they've done in their career and be inspired by that, but just more inspired by his walk with the Lord. You know, he's always so strong with the Lord and. Like we've said before, it's, he's helped straighten his path, and so um, to see him again, I mean, I think that was the first time we played together, and then I think a few years later yeah. to see them at Takata City, keeping out west, um, that was that was great as well. Um, but just you know, when you've got someone like a Ronnie Clark in your team, he, he helps lift the team and the spirit of the team, and then he he does what he does on the field, and it's 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 what you then try and do as well when you go and play in other teams. You know, you try and and, and be like a Ronnie was, be like Michael Wigner was. All those sorts of people. So yeah, a great time. You're um you're pretty durable, Ronnie. Your uh, your playing career was nearly what two decades at, at the top level, whether it was from starting with Auckland all the way to counties, and then to uh, the Richmond Aliis, right? <laughs> Came full circle, um, Pat. I, I must say, I must confess, um, I I played league um, as a kid before I played rugby. 
um, starting in, we lived in Oeraka, um, um and in those earlier years, and it was there I, I kind of discovered this, the game, but I, th I suppose even before then, it wouldn't have been long after I'd started playing league, actually, of where it even first considered in my mind to, to play this game, was Dad sat us down in front of the TV, and um, the All Blacks were playing, and they were playing at Eden Park, they were playing in Scotland, and um, this game was the 75 test against um, in Scotland, but Eden Park was flooded. Oh, and um, I, that game, Dad said to me, son, watch that number 11. And the number 11 was Brian Williams. Um, BG, Sir Brian scored two tries in that game. And I was captivated. You know, I mean, these guys diving in the water and everything else, that was the, probably the first thing that got me. Yeah. And then, but seeing Brian, uh, Sir Brian score those two tries, um, it inspired me, and I think that's probably where a dream had started. That perhaps this boy, born in Samoa, um, could possibly dream and even aspire to become, you know, an All Black and you know play for the All Blacks. And so it wasn't long after that that I was following my cousin to where he was going one day, and um, we came to a big open field, and there were all these kids running around, the, um, passing that same shaped ball that I saw BG and the All Blacks. Um, passing around on on, on TV, yeah. and so it was there that um, I got involved. <laughs> I didn't know at the time it was rugby league. It was a, a rugby league team and yeah. for kids, and I got involved there. And then we moved from Oeraka. From Oeraka, we moved out to Henderson, out west, where I did a lot of my growing and a lot of my rugby years. Kind of started from there, yeah. and um, and so it was um, wasn't until I finished um, rugby and that uh, my brother-in-law um, Pule. Um, to Lisa, he said, "Hey, let's go down to uh, bro. You've got no no uh, allegiances. You've got no you know. There's no um, uh, hindrances in terms of contracts and anything else. Let's go play league." So I thought, "Yeah, hey, why not?" <laughs> play for the league. Um, you got four boys: uh, EJ, uh, Caleb, and the and the young two, which are um, already starting their path on their rugby rugby journey, aren't they? With uh, playing for Waitemata, Jaira and Zahn. Yep, they were kind of getting to that age um, to starting playing rugby and we're kind of trying to decide where they would go. Of course, a certain Uncle Michael um, had got a hold of, started sowing the seed about going to play for Waitemata. And so, of course, these little boys are, yes, okay, Uncle Michael said that we've got to go play for Waitemata. So off we went. When, Jair, when EJ and Caleb were younger, um, I realised I needed to get them into playing rugby in some way and I got them playing at Waitakere. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so... Um, that was quite an experience for me now after being in the middle of the field now you're kind of on the sidelines um, with all the parents and where all the noises and you know and you're standing there and just supporting and just being a cheerleader um, for my kids and um, that was I suppose a real uh, quite a transition for me um, and was quite an eye-opener to <laughs> seeing some of the things on the field I, I, I blocked all those things out yeah. But actually being on the sideline and being a parent and watching and hearing some of the the the, the you know the, the words that are coming from the sideline, I'm like, wow. <laughs> and uh, and you know, and some from parents, some from coaches, and I'm like, wow. Yeah. Oh, I might have to walk down there and <laughs> maybe have a, just have a conversation or or talk to a coach or about just one, how are you trying to get the messages across? Yeah. And and you also using the right the right uh, the right languaging if you like or or just how to you know just think. so it was quite a quite an, an eye opener for me. It was quite interesting, I suppose, Pat. Even kind of when I was getting towards the end of my um, career, um, I'd gone to Japan. We had come back. Um, I I had never been to a World Cup, and. Um, my dream was always to go to a, you know, had obviously when they started the World Cup, so I dreamed that I, you know, I'd love to go and play, made it a goal. Um, it never, and I never count, I never ever counted myself out for it, bro. I knew even in the older, the later years, um, that I knew that if I just get my body right and I just get myself on the field, that I had an opportunity, I had a chance to really pit myself against, you know, um, others that were that I was playing against, the opposition who I was playing against. Um, the incumbency that I was playing against. And, but I was now 30, even I'd come back from Japan and I was back playing um, even NPC with counties. Again, it still had that same mentality. 
and that don't count yourself out. Never count yourself out. Just get your body right. But I was, um, I, I was, I was, I, I come back, paid for Waitakere, paid for counties. Was going to play another season for counties as Kevin Putt asked me to help take the team into the first division. And so I prepared for a season. But in the earlier um, first game of the of the of the season at club rugby, I, I hurt my shoulder. So. Um, and it was quite uh, quite timely too because it was kind of the same week that Shekina, who was my daughter, who, my daughter, my daughter, she was ten at the time. She was having on a camp, and I went on. I said to her, "Well, she kind of looked bad. Can come on this camp with you." So we went on camp with her. And the interesting thing about that camp was, and I still, with the down the back of my mind, get myself right, get myself out on the field again, and get into play. But while I was on that camp, and when the kids were were asleep. And his parents were sitting there. The conversations that started to happen was that some of the parents were saying, "Oh, well, I'm going to kick my kid out of out of home when he's 16." I'm like, "Oh, okay." And another one would say, we'll "Talk about and some of the conversation there. Oh, I'm going to, yeah, my, my my daughter's probably going to end up leaving." And I thought, "Wow." And as I sat there, I thought, "Man, Shekina, my daughter, she's 10. Um, EJ and Caleb are eight and seven, and I just thought, gosh." If I only have six, five or six years to with my kids and they wanted to leave home, I have to make these the best years that I can. You know, they've been supporting, they've been coming to watch dad over the years and everything else. And, you know, and we had a good life, but I realized that if I only had five, six years to be a cheerleader for my kids before they want to leave home, if they're going to leave home, then I've got to make them the best years that I can. And in that instant, rugby left that desire, <laughs> the desire, the dream to play in a World Cup or put myself out there for selection for a World Cup. It finished. It left me. I sitting in that in, in that in that with the together with the parents and just weighing up these two options: a World Cup, the dream of a World Cup my my kids you know and as i sat there i just sat there and i went i choose my kids and i said goodbye to the dreams i said goodbye to the to the rugby and it left me and so i got on the phone and called siala and i said to her in the middle of horton's bush out in the, who, <laughs> who knew her, um, out south auckland i said i decided right in that moment that i was ready to finish and give my you know my attention my everything for my my of my kids, and uh, become a cheerleader, and so that's how really in essence how I found myself on the sidelines supporting, and I got EJ and Caleb, uh, EJ and Caleb involved in rugby straight away. She kind of got into netball, and I was became a cheerleader for my kids, and so they, they're all still home, which is a great thing. <laughs> she kind is 24, and Caleb's obviously away with 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 Simmons and other things. 22 and uh, EJ 22 and Caleb at 21 and and the little boys are 8 and 10, and 10 but they're all home so you know I'm thankful that you know I could still have this opportunity to really um, to, to make those these years quality um, for my kids so that was the thing that was kind of really really made it for me to transition out of rugby that it came to that decision. Uh, Jay anything you want to um you want to uh, add or, or anything, any other questions you want to ask Ronnie? Oh, just a quick question. Uh, Ronnie, is, uh, is veganism the key to longevity or at least the strong <laughs> game? You, coming from two follically challenged uh, admirers. Is that, is that the key to veganism? <laughs> I, it might be more the genetics, I think, bro. But uh, yeah, it's interesting that uh, with, with the vegan, I, I've had, I had a lot of people ask me, are you vegan? Are you vegan? Well, the truth of that was a friend of my friend of mine had, um, had, had who is vegan, wonderful Samoan brother. He, he challenged me. He said, "Can you do it for a month?" There is a global challenge for vegan that if you can do it for a month. And so I did it, and it was a great experience. I dropped a lot of weight, um, and I, but I had a lot of people asking me, "Oh, Ronnie, ex Oblex, not vegan?" But it was it was a challenge that a friend of mine that uh, that, that so that put me onto you know. There's still those challenges that you want to take on and, and do it. And so I was really thankful for that because it really was. It was it, it kind of really put me on and to help me to discover, hey, there's other different ways to do life and um, to, and to, and to eat. And that was quite a, a brilliant one for me too. Good experience. 
Yeah. But I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a kind of war still, so. <laughs> just, just before we close off, um, Ronnie, wh wh where's that name from? What is that? Irani is not a Samoan name, and nor is it a, a Tongan as well, because that is part of my blood um, as well. My mum's also part Tongan, and so um, to give you the, the story of that, um, that pad is, Irani is a Fijian name, and um, Irani means Aaron. And the way it came about was um, in, the early, in the early 60s, very early 60s, uh, it might have been even before then too, that New Zealand government and the Pacific and particularly Samoa um, had the relationship where um, our, um, the, the students in Samoa, when they're sixth and seventh form, or the fifth form or sixth form, they would sit an exam. And if you were successful, then you would spend your last senior years in New Zealand. So dad was successful and he came to New Zealand. He was at Wanganui Boys College. And while he was there, he befriended a Fijian scholarship student as well. They became really, really good friends. Pat. They um, played first 15 together. Eroni was a, was a center as well. And they became such really good friends that they made a pact that their firstborn sons, when they go home, they, they start a family, their firstborn sons, that they would name each other's names. And dad honored that pact with, uh, this, with this gentleman, Eroni Vangahiku, and, um, and named me when I was born, named me Eroni. Wow. So, um, so that's been, uh, you know, a story that's always, um, uh, that has been really important to me too. So that, uh, to know that, that that's my dad, um, there's a legacy of, of, of honoring um, his, you know, the, his word that he, that's what he was going to do. He's never seen Irani since. I do know and I've, I've, I have connected him with Irani's family because I went to find him as well. And, um, but he'd passed away, he, unfortunately, um, years ago. And this was just before I, I'd uh, made my debut for, um, for Auckland too, when, when it all started. So he just passed away before then. What races have you got mixed into that rugged body of yours? <laughs> so whenever people ask me, well, where's your, you know, what's, you know, what's your, um, where are you from? And I said, well, I began to tell them, my father, my father's from the village of Saluafata um, in Samoa. Um, the Clark, though the Clark name is from the village of Letongo. Um, mom, mom is from the village of Vayala um, in Apia, but she's also of Tonga descent um, from Kolomotua in Tonga in Havelu, and so um, very strong connection to our Tongan side. Um, the Clark name, the Clark hails from um, Ireland, especially the northern part of Ireland bordering Scotland, um, where Ian Clark is, um, uh, is from. And so those are kind of our connections and our bloodlines and, as well in terms of where we're from and and where um, we hail from too, bro. So, yeah. I can, I can see some of that Tongan bloodline coming out in your boy, Caleb. <laughs> yes, a lot of people have made that reference. Uh, that's the Tongan side. Uh, so, oh, well, he yeah. that's uh, I'm sure I speak on behalf of Jack when I say thank you very much for your time also. It's been a real privilege and an honor. Uh, when I first started doing this podcast with Jack, we just came back from Hong Kong. You were always one of the people that I, I really you know, wanted to sit down and have a, have a talk to. So, um, like I said to your son, there's a lot of people that say, don't meet your heroes because they turn out to be people that you don't really like. And a lot of, a lot of the time that, that is the case. But uh, mm -hmm. when we meet people like yourself that, that are, um, have good intentions and, and have good morals, then that saying doesn't abide by you guys. So um, I really appreciate your time. Also, thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. Anything you want to say in closing, brother? Yeah, yeah, I've got time to more. Um, um, we have a connection pad, you know, our, our history in terms of where we've gone through. We talk about pathways and paths of leadership and that we've um, gone through that, uh, the, the, the best um, leadership academy together. Um, again, those uh, in terms of our development, um, and so we have that uh, that journey together, bro. And as we continue the journey and and that calling of influence in our lives out of that too, bro. This is this um, platform here that you're using, a way to influence is is awesome. And I thank you, thank you so much for this opportunity that to you and Jack for creating this this opportunity for us to tell our stories. And so you know it, uh, and so that we can influence and we can encourage, we can inspire um, and unify our communities even more so. 
and um, and to Jack as well. We have our, you know, we saw as already mentioned in terms of rugby. Um, it was a privilege to have that, and that's always a big thing for us is the the, the older generations are seeing our young guns coming through. And what was more pleasing for us um, is looking at our next generation, understanding the importance that is of in terms of influencing the next generation and others as well. And here you're doing it here even more so, Jack. And even when you're overseas, playing in, in Hong Kong, uh, Jack, over there, and and in other and overseas as well, playing there. Well done, my law lover, my rolling out of Thanks again, brothers. Thank you for this privilege of being part of this program. I look forward. I do look forward to coming back on again. Um, I think there's because there will be to give updates and other things and other what's happening, particularly in this uh, this role as the Pacific Engagement Manager role. Um, this opportunity we have at New Zealand Rugby. Yeah. Right. Jay, anything in closing? Yeah. Again, just a big malo apito and pafta lava afyonga sabe tama. I mean, it really is a blessing to to see you again and to hear your voice and, and to see what you're doing and just to, to share this time with you and the time that we have. So looking forward to the next one. It's going to be awesome. For sure. All right. So as I always sign off, all love, no hate. God bless. Falaia. Anaka.